Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I don't know what time you guys will take in today's dialogue. We are on the first dialogue of the 2023 year. We're closing out Black History Month. We're closing it out with some CUNY BMI OGs, as we would say, some alumni, some current students, some former staff and, and overall faculty uh, all-stars, I would say, from the CUNY My programs across the university. My name is Jorge Alguera. I am the Deputy Director of the CUNY My program at, at the Central Office. We have a fantastic dialogue for you all. We will be talking about elevating our history through art, literature, and film. As I mentioned, we have three amazing panelists. I am going to introduce you to each one of them. As I introduce you, please make sure that you big up yourself. You, you tell us, tell everybody who is tuning in what you're doing and some uh, background as to why you're here, why, you, why you've been working with the CUNY Black Man Initiative in whatever capacity you have been. So we'll start with the newest of the bunch. We'll start with Jordan Sutton. Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, how you doing? Um... So my name is Jordan Sutton, and I am a communications assistant with uh, Urban Male Leadership Academy, UMLA for short. Um, I'm also a videographer, photographer, and a recent graduate from um, Bronx, uh, I'm Bronx, Borough of Manhattan Community College. Um, just a little bit about myself. Nice. Thank you so much for that, Jordan, and congratulations on graduating. It's, it's never... A small feat. Then we'll go to Mr. Mala, Divine Mala. Please let us know what you're up to and uh, some more of your background. True indeed. Peace. I'd like to say thank y'all for allowing me to um, participate with y'all good people this afternoon. So my name is Mala, Divine Mala. I'm an author. I'm a publisher. Um, I, I'm a social justice advocate. Um, professionally, I work with um, juveniles and secure detention as a reentry coordinator, and I do speaking engagements. Fantastic. And we love to see all your works there and your background. We'll, we'll touch base on some of those and how anybody who's tuning in would be able to support you uh, by purchasing any of these books. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Tomeskin. Tokare, who is has been part of the Kina B and my family, man, how many years was that already? And now moving on to just even more amazing things. So let us know uh, what you've been up to. Yeah, uh, my name is Tomeskin uh, Takure. I'm um, super excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Jorge. Uh, it's always great to be with BMI family. I've been a part of the family since 2010, um, working with BMI. I worked with an organization inside CUNY. Uh, for 12 years, uh, called Creative Arts Team. Uh, they used to come around and do workshops uh, at all the BMI uh, different sites. So I, I've touched every campus, every contract with BMI over these last 12 years. I've built amazing relationships with people. Um, now I'm a DEIA consultant, diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility. Um, so I'm taking all this knowledge and uh, everything that I, I've went through in my life, and I'm helping companies become better companies. Um, I'm an artivist, so I'm an actor uh, and an artist and an activist. Uh, so I'm super excited to be here and have this conversation uh, to the other panelists. It's nice to meet you. So let's get into it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. We truly, truly appreciate each and every one of you are going to bring a different perspective as to what art and what elevating the history of the diaspora looks like in different mediums. And uh, I, I like that term, artivist. I think it's, it's fantastic. I think it's missing a lot from the conversations that, that we hold. Um, as many of you know, right, like um, public school systems and the art and the music, that funding has been taken uh, away from from our students, from our kids. And perhaps um, maybe Jordan doesn't know because he's the youngest one of the bunch, but you know, we used to get music lessons in class, right? So with that, let's talk about what what led you here? What opened up the door for, for the particular art or the particular space 
that you are in. Let's start with Mala, since since you already have multiple works um, displayed. So let's start with that. So we'll start with like the brothers art of vision. I'm gonna go with the only uh, fiction book that I got up there right now, which is um, the Hidden Hand of Rally of Souls, the Yellow Book. And um, in that book, what really made me want to write that book was once upon a time I was incarcerated, and um, we convinced at the time I was a teacher's aide, and I convinced the um teacher to sponsor a creative writing class for us to teach other people how to write. And actually, I'm probably a better sci-fi writer than I'm um, an urban f fiction writer, but you know, it's a, it's a lot of layers to that. So I used to see like the younger, the younger people around me when I was on the, the level two, they used to read a lot of the hood novels, right? And um, I was like, I'm talking about it was a big, a big trade in hood novels. Like they would come across the yard willing to catch a infraction to trade these books. So I was like, God damn, like what's in these books? Like I read a few, like Sister Soldier, Coldest Winter Ever, um, Nikki Turner, um, Hustler White, uh, Terry Woods, True to the Game. And I feel like if you've read those three, you've read all of them, right? So, cause I don't see no the subject matter change. So once I see that people was really locked in, me being culturally, I'm a five percenter. So I say, you know what? I'm gonna write a, I'm gonna write one of these books, but I'm gonna call it an urban political street thriller, cause you know I, I liked the um certain books when I was coming up by Donald Goins. He wrote two books, Kiana Part One and Two. So and um the spook that sat behind the door by Green, and um yeah, those two books had like an impact on what you can do with um urban fiction from a street perspective. So what I did was I took characters that I would like to see and how would these characters elevate? So I took one character, you know, put him in a scenario where he did time in a federal institution. And we know that it's still um, political prisoners in these federal institutions and in these states institutions. So it's like a what if scenario. What if he ran across somebody from the Black Liberation Army that you know elevates his thinking, but he never changes his tactics, and then he gets put back out in society. I said it in Bushwick, of course. I'm Brooklyn, born and raised in in Bushwick. That's the neighborhood I grew up in, and so I wanted to. So with, with gentrification, police brutality, and um, all the different ills that go on in urban communities, I was like, well, what if this individual come home? and creates a urban guerrilla team, right? So that's like the gist of that, but as it shows the connection between this generation and the next generation through the Afro pick. That's why you always see me with my Afro, can't probably see, but my Afro pick with the fist, cause it's a, it's a science called symbology. So I use that as a symbology, like to show the connection from this generation to the last generation that, these ideologies, this is not going nowhere. It's just being repackaged. Then I put it, of course, in the street set. And, and his cousin happened to be one of the strongest um, players in the um, street game. So that pushes the action. So that's why it's called the duality of self. Because this is this you. You might be one person, but you always got two selves inside of you, and whichever one you feed, that's the one grows and the other one dies. So that's like the gist of that, and that's why I say like I feel like I'm the father of that genre, the, the urban political street thriller, you know, because that's like the first book. Hopefully, it'd be more. That's what's that's up. What I, you know what? I'm 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 here taking notes. If you see me moving around, it's because I'm I'm trying to keep up with with all these. This is the, I love that urban political street thrillers. We we're gonna have to make some space for for that on 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 the Barnes and Nobles and the Amazon.com. Uh, Tomeskin, tell us tell us about your your side of of the art spectrum. Yeah, I mean, I gotta go from the beginning, right? Um, my father came here from East Africa, Eritrea, and he's a visual artist. I mean, you know, amongst other things, his his gift to the world was visual art through the form of like wood sculpturing. Um, and now me being a father of two, um, I definitely can see the connections. Like I received 
that from him. So as a young age, I, I kind of moved into visual art and I always wanted to draw. Um, I had a fascination with instruments at a really, really young age. Um, and then as I grew older and older and older, I kind of fell in, in love with storytelling. And just, uh, you know, before I had the language of what a griot was, um, I was always enamored by, I mean, everyone from telling stories from like, you know, the person on the block, you know, uh, who had a rough life hearing their story at a young age, to the preacher in the pulpit, to the people on movie screens. Uh, and I kind of started to lean towards that storytelling. Um, and that got me into acting. Um, I went to Texas Southern University, uh, HBCU in Houston. Um, and I studied that. Uh, and I took it really serious. And um, following college, I moved to LA, I worked there for a little bit, then I came to New York. And that's where I truly stepped into what an artist is and an artivist is. So uh, when I came to New York, started working um, in different shows. Uh, when I say shows, I'm talking about plays. Um, and I didn't have the, the, the once again, the vocabulary and the language that I have now because I was such a young man. Um, but I gravitated to projects that were telling stories that were empowering. Um, and I didn't understand why I gravitated to that. But, you know, when you process life and, you know, you reflect, I realized that my father and my uncles and my mom, like everybody around me, you know, they always push for the positive story and not necessarily the positive story, just not the demeaning stories. Um, it wasn't something that I was uh, around a lot. Um, and that led me into using my art form to be a change agent in my community. And that brought me to CUNY, uh, where I definitely harnessed and, 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 and really figured that out. So um, my brother said, you know, he was uh, incarcerated. I worked with formerly incarcerated people um, using this art form of theater. And when I say theater, I don't mean Shakespeare to be or not to be. I mean, like true theater, like what we go through as human beings personified uh, right there in front of you and then holding a conversation and figure out how do we truly get to a space uh, of unity? How do we truly get to a space of true community? How do we truly get to a space of loving one another? Sometimes it's learning how to converse with one another, right? Have those tough conversations about conflict. Understanding conflict doesn't necessarily happen in that moment, but it may have happened in your childhood and now it's just manifesting itself in that moment. So my art, this acting, this theater, this whatever it is now at this point, um, that led me down several different paths. Uh, like I said, working with CUNY BMI uh, and the students like for years and years, for 12 years, you know, I'm an old man now. I came in as a young man, kind of like Obama, and now my hair is gray and I got locks and I got a beard and all of that to put on extra pounds. Um, but I came in as this young man, kind of like uh, my brother Jordan down there. And now I'm like this old man, you know, with all these stories. Um, but with BMI, um, one specific uh, thing that happened, we were getting ready to go to uh, a college. Uh, can I name the college, Jorge? Yeah. All right. yeah. Um, it, was it was 2016, um, and we we're getting ready to go to Hunter College. Uh, it was the day after um, uh, uh, Donald Trump was elected. Um, and I had to face these students and, and have this conversation. The conversation was supposed to be about something completely different, but I remember sitting down with my uh, co-facilitator, uh, Jennifer Gill, who's another amazing artist uh, who does amazing things. I remember sitting down with her and having the conversation like, yo, we can't just walk in this room and not talk about what's going on. But at the same time, as people of color, she's a, Dominic a Black Dominican and I'm African-American, we had to bring context and, and really have a great conversation. So those conversations away from the art started to form into this thing that is now diversity, equity, and inclusion. And to be completely transparent, um, it's been around for a while, but it didn't catch steam until that tragic day in 2020 when uh, um, George Floyd was murdered, you know, by a police officer. Um, so that led me away from CUNY um, into the new space that I'm in now. And now I'm really able to sit down with, uh, people at different levels to truly get this understanding of what it means to be diverse, what it means to be equitable, what it means to include people, and not most important, but extremely important, what does it mean for things to be accessible? So that's how I sit here today. Um, and once again, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And yes, I mean, I remember 
2016 is when I was kind of like starting out uh, in BMI when I was the program director over at Queens College. And the first time I saw you and, and Jennifer, as a matter of fact, come in, um, I had to sit on the side. And to a certain extent, I looked at the students as like, you guys aren't even understanding the levels and the magnitude of the conversations that are happening right now. But I did see the engagement. And I think, as, as you were saying, having the conversations in, in a diverse, as diverse a, a speech as possible so that people are able to feel safe in, in sharing their stories. I think that's one of the things that, that I love uh, the most about the, the creative arts team and, and how you guys would bring the conversations, whether it was something, um, maybe I guess, I, I don't know that any of the themes that you guys have are can be considered trivial, but maybe less hard hitting, it might be the, the right uh, word. And um, I, I, I really admire the work that, that you guys are doing. And, and thank you for having done that. Now, Jordan, tell us about you. What, what opened up the door for you to get into uh, art space, story telling, uh, telling space and communications, right? Uh, let us know. Uh, yeah, so I, so for me, um, I, I've always known uh, from a, a young age that I've always wanted to be somewhere within the entertainment field, right? Um, I've considered myself a storyteller. Um, as a matter of fact, I didn't even give myself that title. Um, that was really more of like my friends and family who kind of gave me that title. And um, I, I knew that I had a, you know, a, a pretty much, um, you know, just a strong uh, feeling for, you know, telling a story, whether it's a story about my own personal life, or a story about, you know, you just, uh, uh, you know, um, back in the days, like I'm just hanging out with my friends, we, we on the corner, like, we you know, and we're telling stories. And, um, you know, from from then I started to dive into um, different forms of media. Um, it, it started with, um, you know, just digital marketing and um, I got into acting and modeling for a little bit, um, you know, but then all, all of those things that I pursued, um, I, I remember having, you know, just difficulty uh, trying to get into that field. And I, you know, for me, mostly that was because the people around me didn't necessarily know what it meant to, you know, be or have a passion for things like that, or it was a it was a fable to, um, you know, be in in that kind in that creative industry, period. You know, it was never a, a real thing. So, you know, and I I had you know close people to me, family, loved ones, sadly, and you know, although they had the right and you know good intentions, they definitely scared me away from you know, pursuing that kind of passion and, you know, told me, you know, I have to find something a little bit more realistic and, you know, and that it shot my pride, you know, shot my pride. So, um, you know, I started pursuing other things that kind of, um, I had no real interest in, but I just thought that it was the right thing to do. Right. Um, so, you know, psychology and all these different avenues, possibly becoming a doctor or a nurse or whatever it is that they say is a typical standard job or career field that you should pursue. And um, although it seems that that may have, would have been a detour for me, it also, what it really did was actually teach me how much more of a storyteller I was and um, kind of brought me right back full circle to where I am today. Um, because now, and I forgot to mention this earlier, um, now, uh, what I really consider myself is not, it's more than just a storyteller. Um, I'm a, I'm a mental health, mental health advocate. I'm an activist. I'm one who, um, you know, who stands strongly and firmly in my beliefs and, you know, and, and look to, you know, advocate and help others, you know, for what, what their beliefs are, regardless if they align with mine or not. Um, you know, so. I, I found that passion and then I just I, I thought to myself like how do I get myself out there how do I begin to you know now be able to um, you know pursue my passion along with all these different tangible uh, feelings that you know I feel like it, it's part of me and 
you know, it was just simply that um, I want to do filmmaking. I want to do um, some sort of directing and producing and whatnot. And then that's when I started like, you know, really diving into uh, different, um, you know, actors, producers, directors, and coming across, you know, obviously learning more about um, people like Spike Lee and um, uh, what's it called, uh, Tyler Perry, you know, people, two great directors and producers who not only direct and produce, but also acted in their own, in their own film. Um, you know, and that's where the motivation and the drive really came from. It was just like being able to see a representation, like somebody who's like me, uh, somebody who looks like me and being able to say, hey, they were able to do it and their life, you know, where they came from wasn't, at, you know, any more fortunate than mine. And they somehow made it happen, you know, and so that's that's kind of what really gave me the, the drive to say, you know what, I'm all these things. I'm an activist. I'm a mental health advocate. You know, uh, you know, I'm I'm a man of faith. And, you know, and the way how I'm going to put that on full screen is that I'm going to do it through my storytelling. I'm going to do it through, um, you know, writing movies. So it took a long journey for me to get, uh, you know, you know, a lot of like, you know, around the ways to finally get to like, you know, now I, I have a very young face, but I'm be, I'm turning 30 this year, you know, making a big 3-0. Um, yeah, and <laughs> so I, 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 I kind of, um, you know, during the pandemic, it, it kind of just hit me, you know, I was in a little bit of a depression and, you know, trying to figure out purpose and all these things, you know, the pandemic hit everyone really hard. Um, and during the pandemic, I got my first uh, digital camera. And, um, you know, I, it, it just went from there, from YouTube channels, learning how to, you know, just operate the camera from how to take a, a really clean uh, photo. And, you know, like yeah, about a year and a, about a year ago now, yeah, because a year ago now, I just graduated. I decided to come back to school and learn it professionally. Um, and, and, and just, you know, really just, you know, taking every aspect of the craft and, you know, just finding mentors and seeing how, how I could further pursue what I'm, what I'm trying to do. Um, so in a nutshell, that's how I came to, you know, uh, be where I am today and to be a graduate at BMCC. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for that. And I think one of the underlying messages that that should go through this dialogue for anybody who's tuning in and anyone who's sharing the the message with with their colleagues and and students perhaps right is like we as a society i would say um tend to elevate the voices and the images of those who have made it, right you mentioned jordan you, men you mentioned uh spike lee you mentioned tyler perry and then you know we have multiple so michael b jordan and lupita nyong and so on and so forth uh, i think in this particular dialogue one of the things that i i want people to take uh away is you know there are multiple steps right like jordan is just starting out in, in finally doing what he's felt he's been meant to do for a long time tamaskin has been doing it for a long time and then He's he's also been able to see what the next what the next step is. Mala has you know been creating work for a really long time and having had to pivot uh, based on life circumstances and and so it's important to understand for anybody watching right like you you have to start somewhere. It's not going to be a straight line. Right? We we all kind of have different different obstacles and I think. The, that same word pivot right we we've known it as as Tomeskin has said DEI has been a, a, around for a really long time and it's not until something explosive happens that it, it kind of took on to what society has done uh the pandemic has made people's pivot forced uh, a lot of people to pivot right even even uh, how we work on a daily basis working from home working virtually so uh with that in mind I, I want to kind of get into the next topic, right? Uh, Jordan, you mentioned that even your own family 
in in a way was an obstacle for you to get to where you got today because they wanted you to have more realistic uh, expectations of what your career would take you. So I'll just throw this out to the panel and whoever wants to jump on first, tell us uh, about some of the other, I guess, obstacles or or um, things that made you pivot in your in your journey to get to uh, where, where you got to tell us about, you know, as as Jordan has mentioned, you know, it takes a toll on your mental health. So tell us how you fought through some of those things to, and, and and your your wins and obviously your losses in, in that same journey. So whoever wants to take this question. Um, so, oh, go ahead, um, go ahead. Yeah, with, as far as myself, right, like really starting off with the writing, like I didn't know, I've never saw a laptop until 2014. I didn't know what Wi-Fi was and or a browser. So it's like these are three needs that I had to get to understand to even write, right? So then once I understood, you know, those dynamics, probably one of the reasons why I, I, I went back to school for technology, because I didn't want to be illiterate, neither out there. So then after that, understanding how to go about publishing a book, which was a whole nother journey in itself, because, you know, the traditional way is you get you an uh, agent first. So, so first you have to get somebody to like your work, then he has to go take your work to publishers who gotta like your work, right? So in this whole process, you could be, you could be frozen for years, literally, and what they pay you off your work doesn't add up. So once I started understanding the opportunities with self-publishing, especially if you have a guerrilla mentality, right? So independent guerrilla mentality. So learning that, and then learning the difference between vanity houses and true self-publishing, that was another leg in the journey until I understood how to truly publish my work itself and from A to Z and get it out to the people. Once I did that, a thing that I really learned that people don't really, people don't really read no more like they used to. And I think that, you know. I think with with the audio books and stuff, like none of my books is on audio books yet, right? But the seeing that people don't like to read because everything is 30 second clips and stuff like that, to me, that's been more of a challenge. So it's like writing is, to me, is like, it's natural because it's like meditative. And I've always been a creative person. I came through hip hop. I used to MC and produce in the 90, early 90s. So, you know, so creating is like, I, I think to me is like water, you know, a sustenance to me. But the obstacles I face in writing is the, the understand that people don't really like to read no more. And it's like, do I continue writing, which is a passion of mine, or do I fall back? Like these last, these four books, is all the books that I put out within the last seven years. So, you know, on one level, that's a lot of body of work. On another level, depending on who you are, I'm pretty sure it's nothing that's stiff and king, mean <laughs> cooks, right? But um, so these are the obstacles and then trying to like, to see where people at and trying to still tell an honest story because that's still my first novel. The other books is all, they all nonfiction based off of my journey. And they actually, the other books actually tell my journey professionally. Like the, the, the Black and Gold book, that's my second book called Prison Survival Hell's Prison. So I put that out because that's my journey of almost doing 20 years in prison in Virginia. So at the time I was working on the Close Rikers Island campaign, as well as the Prisoners Human Rights March. And I felt like, and I was working with youth that was on probation. So I felt like if I don't tell my own story, then I'll be a hypocrite. So, you know, that's how that book came out. 
the second, the, 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 the green book, Reentry Strategies and Staying Free, was actually a book I was writing to show how I got off parole early. But since I was also a re I'm a reentry coordinator, I said, and reentry is actually big thing right now. You know, you'll hear a lot of things about returning citizens and all that. So I said, okay, let me, you know, put that in that genre. And the last book was a book of poems that I had. And, it, and it's an honor to one of, one of my bigger brothers that I, you know, that I met since I've been home. He had an organization called The Struggle Was Real. And I used to and I used to always work with him with that organization. It was out in Queens. And um, he passed away from COVID. And he never had a chance to um put his book of poems out. And I had all these poems I, that, I, that I was never going to put out. So I said, yo, let me put this book out and dedicate it to him and his honor and his memory. So, you know, so 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 you see the, the challenges as well as, you know, I feel like even putting them books out is was also my triumphs at the same time. And people that have read at least the first two, you know, I get good feedback and um and they they always looking for something else to write, but you know, support gotta be there because I haven't recouped anything on any of those books. So right now it's just a labor of love. And that's my, my journey. Thank you so much for that. Uh, very powerful stuff. I think, you know, um, a, a lot of, and I think even in, in the music industry, right? Uh, everybody talks about and thinks about th that signing bonus and getting signed by a big label. But as, as you broke it down, right? You almost have like this middleman of approval. You have to have approval from an agent that's going to kind of push that, right? You have to have the approval from a publisher. And then you need to have the approval from the people to make sure that 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 your work takes off. And and, and these are kind of like the the little, to put it that way, although not so little, obstacles that most people don't think about. And as creatives, I think a lot of people are just concentrated on putting out the work and not, not understanding or not thinking about what um, the, the mechanics of it would be. Uh, Tomeskin, tell us about your journey and, and some of these yeah. and else. Yeah, thank you for that, Mila. Um, You put a lot just on me right now. So thank you for your honesty uh, about your journey. Um, so I think there's two things, right? I think there is my creativity and my art, right? And then I think there is the presentation of the curated experience that I want folks to have. Um, there was a rapper who was recently canceled who said, every agent I know knows I hate agents, right? And you can Google whoever that is. I know we can't mention him on here. Um, but I remember getting an agent for the first time and, and, and sitting there thinking like, this is not going to work just because of who I am and who my parents instilled me to be like, I, I need, I need to have control of my creativity. Like that is a, is a, is a non-negotiable for me. Like I need 100% control of what I'm doing creative. Um, that is not an agent's job to give you 100% control. Right. So in my twenties, I was angry at the world. Ah, everybody's racist. Nobody knows anything. You don't understand creativity, right? Um, then you live a little bit and you look back like, oh no, the game that you were playing, I wasn't playing that game, right? So I went on the basketball court with, with football cleats and, and, you know, and it's like, now I'm angry because I broke my ankle, but it's like, no, I was playing the wrong game. So I want to just set that context. Um, but my journey as a, as a, professional performer, I guess you will, has always been supported with other jobs. So I'm not going to sit here and, and be like, oh, man, you know, I reached this one point where I was just making crazy money. Even when the money was flowing, that immigrant inside of me said, you need to have a job because it's going to end at some point. Case in point, as I sit here now, um, before moving into this artivism space, I was a bartender and I was that's where I made the most money in my life, if I'm honest, working nightlife in New York City as a bartender, making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, sometimes thousands a night was, was just a, a different um, lifestyle. And that supported what I did in the daytime 
But what began to happen was the world started mending together, right? So I started to notice I didn't have the energy to go to an audition anymore because I was up till 4 a.m. mixing drinks and doing a Cosmo, right? Doing, doing all that stuff, right? So, um, so I had to pivot, right? Pivot. I pivoted into CUNY, but I didn't just pivot into CUNY. I pivoted into a mentor, right? So I pivoted into Keith Johnston, who was my director uh, at CUNY for, I don't know, 10 years. Uh, then he retired and two years later, I had to get up out. But um, so I had that mentor, right, along the way, no matter what. But even when I reflect back in college, I had a mentor to kind of show me the way. Um, so whenever I pivoted, there was always someone there that I revered. Um, it's almost like God. I don't know if we could talk about God, but it's almost like God continues to put me into places with people who can help me harness my creativity, but also like mentor, M-E-N-T-O-U-R, right? Like they gave me a tour of what it meant. They were my, these are my tour guides into being a man. Um, and I know this isn't about, you know, that, but my art then is a reflection of that as well, right? So now my art is more into pouring into my community. So when I create something, I want to pour into my community. My community during COVID was my wife and my kid. Now I have two kids. So the art that I had to pick up because I needed that creativity is water. Like you said, Malai, it's water that I needed. And I started to feel malnutrition. You can't see back there, but I picked up the guitar, right? So then the guitar began to allow me to pour into my kids when I play guitar and, you know, sing, you're welcome. Do -de 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 That's uh, Moana, right? That's what my daughter likes. So I learned that song and I pour it into her in that kind of way. But then it also leads me into like all these pivots, pivots are happening. Um, when I pivot into the job that I have now, now I have to bring creativity in a space that is not creative at all, right? So all these different pivots, and I have another mentor, <laughs> that I that that they they line me up with. Um, but now I'm in a space where my creativity can help people and also help my family in a financial way that other times it didn't happen. So those are the pivots that I had to take, right? And even I don't know where I'll be next year or the year after. I'm quite sure there's going to be another pivot, but no matter what the pivot's going to be, it will be creative. Um, and it'll be, you know, a, a presentation of my creativity. However, that water that I drink every day, I look at when you present art, it's 90% your rehearsal time, right? 5% whatever marketing that you did. And the actual presentation is only 5%, right? Like if you write a book, if you play an instrument, if you are an actor, if you're a filmmaker, by the time that film is actually made and someone is actually experiencing it, they're only experiencing 5% of the 95% it went into creating that piece of uh, work. So that's where I am now with the pivots in my life is being conscious about that 5% that I do put out, making sure that I'm full with the 90% at home or wherever I am. And I'm a creative being in any space that I go into. Wow. Thank, thanks for that. I mean, just this this itself is like it's starting to feel more like an open mic than it is a dialogue right like you know um and and funny enough Tomaskin was the the moderator for when we when we had the um our spoken word artist drop, dropping some bars and that that was dope so um i think what you guys have said and right like and i think we've laid a foundation for everybody to understand it hasn't been a straight line it hasn't been a fast lane it hasn't been anything that is as simple as Tomeskin just said, you know, 95% of the art is before people even see it. And so let's, let's, let's say we fast forward to we're ready to present, right? Mala has his books, Tomeskin has his, his workshops and he has his DEI consulting and he has whatever it is that he's worked on. Jordan is getting ready to invite us all to the premiere of, of, uh, of his documentary at the Tribeca Film Festival, whatever it is, right? Let's talk about the support 
that our own community, that our own people can, should, and perhaps aren't giving our own artists? What, what are the things that you're seeing are hindering that support towards uh, our own uh, Black and, and Latino uh, film creators, poets, writers? What are, what are some of those, those things? Jordan, can, uh, can you start with that for us, please? Um, yeah, uh, so some things that I would say that's um, definitely hindersome when it comes to just being able for uh, uh, Black and Latinos to share their stories and what they offer are two, uh, two main um, factors, I'll say, are one is uh, vis visibility and the other is resources, right? And the reason I say the, the, these are the two main factors that sort of um, I if if I can't see you I don't know what you're what you're doing or what you're talking about. And for the resources part, if 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 I don't know how to even get in front of people, then you know I just can't do it. And right now, like the the mainstream platforms right now are are so bombarded, um, and bombarded mostly in my opinion I say with with a lot of uh, black appropriated content and um you know so like i could go through any social media account uh instagram tiktok whatever it is and you know you won't know a lot of these um the the creators of whatever it is a dance a saying um whatever it may be and when it comes to creativity it's it's kind of it's a little bit difficult to um you know brand or like hold your title to that copyright to say that this was my thing you know um it's a little bit difficult when it comes to the creative side um especially if you're just you know like an 18 year old kid or 17 year old kid behind your computer and you're just recording yourself and you put something out there and it goes viral one time and you know you're forgotten you know you're you're, you're getting no um you know publicity any recognition for anything that you just put forth out there right and, you know, so when it comes to the creative side, it's, it's difficult, you know, that w when you're, when it comes to the visibility, because, and really what it is, is like, it's basically whitewashed and you're, you're getting all these contents that are from people that are doing things, are doing dances, uh, saying phrases or whatever it may be that came from black content creators but we will never know who that person is right and it's it's also that you know not many people understand the concept of what it means to be in a creative field like because it's it, they don't understand the professional side of what that what that looks like and because they don't know what the professional side of being in this field looks like they don't know the steps or processes in order to take in order to properly promote themselves, in order to properly copyright their material, making sure that they're getting credit for what they're owed. Um, most people think that, you know, um, you know to, to have a meaningful platform of some sort in, in this field, like that is just a, like a dollar in a dream, you know, you know, where I'm just waking up one day and I go on YouTube and I record something and I hope I hit big. But, you know, and, and maybe like, yeah, there's some people who, make it that way you know but however there's actual real steps that are in play that i'm learning myself now and you know how to properly uh distribute um your material how to properly go through the steps and in order to uh create your material like um tamascus uh, was saying uh you know 95 percent of it you know people will never see you know they will never see the um the the creative part uh, about it all and because of all the because of these two things the you know the lack of visibility and the resources you know there are people like some within our own community and outside our community but they just won't understand why you you know you charge the prices that you charge you know why you would you know say that my thing or whatever I'm my product is worth this much to you to you because of the fact that the amount of time that I've put in behind it 
you know, that stuff is not really understood too well on, you know, on the, on the forefront of things. So, um, and then, you know, I just, there's just, and there's just a lot of gatekeeping when it comes to a, a lot of this and it's been gatekept for so long that it's, like I said, seems a little bit, you know, delusional and a dollar in a dream sort of a chase sort of thing when it could be just as much, you know, if I understood the information, I understood what I needed to do, then I will be able to get the same kind of recognition. You know, you don't need to be the million. Not everybody needs to be Tyler Perry. You know, not everybody needs to be, you know, the next big, you know, Spike Lee. But how, but however, you can have a meaningful platform and sharing your content in a meaningful way and having your audience gravitate towards you because they like what you share. And there's a way to do that, but not everybody understands that concept. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Mala Tomaskin. I'll go and then you can go, uh, Mala. Um, Thank you for saying that, absolutely, the gatekeeping. Um, I'm gonna throw another word out here. It's called white gaze, G-A-Z-E, right? There's this belief, not even amongst artists, but in general in society that we need to appeal to the white eye, right? So art that doesn't fall into that category, even if it is black or Latino art, right? It will not be supported in the commercial sense, the same way that art that does, right? Appeal to that white gaze. You can look on Broadway. I'm quite sure you'll see a lot of examples of white gaze. You can read uh, books, right? Sometimes when I'm reading something, I really have to check myself. I'm like, who is the audience intended for this piece right now? Like, and I, I have to ask myself that constantly, right? And since, you know, since once again, I work in this diversity space, so I, I'm able to see like companies just throwing money at things, right? A lot of times the first thing that they throw money at, you know, in these new diversity initiatives, a lot of times when they throw money at a piece of art, it's something that they feel good about, right? So like I am creating art so white folks can feel good, but they're all black people in it. So now this is now considered black art, but in actuality, most of the time we're, we are not creating black art. I believe it was Du Bois who said, the black artist, when he sits behind the um, typewriter, has to make the conscious decision, do I write for my people or do I write for the masses, right? So I think of like the boom of drill rap in New York and just around the, the globe in general, like these young cats don't have the money to really push a product the way that they do. So who is supporting these products? Who is basically financing these artists to get their art out? The who is important, but more importantly is the why. Why do you choose to support this, right? Because there needs to be a financial push. We can't sit here. If you are creating art for public consumption, there has to be a financial marketing push that happens, right? I am not, I'm not one that believes that, you know, like, you're going to make a living doing poetry at coffee shops. Like, I just don't believe that that's going to happen, right? You're going to pass that cup around, but everybody in there is probably a poet, so they're going to put a dollar in there. So at the end of the night, you got $30. You can get you a cab home and maybe a bacon, egg, and cheese, and you're going to get into bed, and that's going to be what you made for the night because I've been there before, right? So in order to get this commercialized success, you have to appeal to a white audience, and if you do not appeal to a white audience, more than likely, you are not going to get the support and the push that you need to move forward, you know, with whatever the grand goal is. Um, like Mala said, Mala said he wrote all these books. He ain't made no money, right? But I bet if he wrote a book that probably was trying to get the attention of people that probably, you know, those other books, and I haven't read your books, is, you know, if you change the audience, I'm quite sure you would get the attention and you get the support, but at what cost is the question that I always ask myself. All right, what is the cost of your success? Um, so I'll just leave it there. Yeah, wow. Uh, the You mentioned, you know, the, the white gaze immediately what what came to mind on uh, Netflix, there was a show called Hentified, got canceled after two seasons. But I remember part of it. So Hentified in, in Spanish, Hente means people. So it was kind of like a play on word on gentrified and how 
exactly that was happening in the um in the uh, in, in in the neighborhood of Boyle Heights in, in in LA. And so one of the things that, that was happening is there was this young artist uh she was she was portraying a, a queer artist, a visual artist and she gets her big break. Uh this this guy just bought a building and he wanted to have this huge mural and immediately she had that conflict right i'm going to now start creating things that are for the white gays but then in the show you also see the visceral reaction of her people that are that you know yes i'm we're happy that you're making that you're now able to you know pay for stuff for your mom and we all we all kind of have that that dream right i want to buy my mom with that that cadillac or whatever it is so uh, really interesting uh, perspective on that. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think e even there was, I don't remember exactly what the question was, but there was an interview where, where somebody was asking uh, Toni Morrison about her writing and if she was going to change it to, uh, to, to fit that perspective. And, you know, she, she put a halt on that real fast, like, nah, we're not doing that. So Malau, what do you, what do you have to say about, you know, support? What, I mean, you're, you're living it, you're feeling it. Uh, by the way, you're gonna get four orders from me. So uh, let let us know what what was this support. Just make sure you write them book reviews. They help <laughs> for sure, for sure. So I think with me, I think I see a little bit different, and I think that I feel like when it comes to our uh, people, they just ain't ready yet. Like you know, I always say, understand and come in time. And um, maybe I was on a train, maybe a few months ago, and I, I, and I wish I remembered the lady's name. She was a sculptor, but her, her sculptors didn't start to hit until she was 70 years old. And that gave me a different perspective because it's like, you know, sometimes you can be writing, but your writing could, or what you're doing could be ahead of time. And it's like me, actually, I come up in hip hop. Like if hip hop started in 75, I was born in 75. So by the time 85 came, hip hop was what it is. I remember people taking the big boxes from the um, refrigerators or the linoleum, busting them down, break dancing on the corner or after school. Dudes that don't even like each other start pop locking and battling, mushing one another. It's like, so coming up in that era of hip hop where Cats did stuff just for like, yo, this was the love. It wasn't nobody getting no money for real, for real, until maybe uh, Russell Simmons started doing what he was doing. And then a little bit of money came in, but nowhere near the amount of money. So it's like having the understanding that, yo, like we creators, we create everything. There's nothing in the Western hemisphere that we have not created. And if you want to hit musically, I think it was the National Geographic. I got a map out the National Geographic to show the timeline of music over here in the diaspora. So knowing and understanding that, that people are not ready sometimes for how you come because dumbing down is a real thing, right? So when you talk to like, you know, I talk to a lot of young people and what I've seen, which is real disturbing to me, is the amount of, of, of young people that don't read on level, right? And I'm like, this New York, this ain't 1950 New York. This is 2000 and something New York. So what is going on systematically that y'all getting out the third grade and can't read? Really, post first or second, you should know how to read. So when I look, I think it's a bigger, a, a bigger problem. And I think that artists, real artists, are the true sayers of the people, just like they say the comedian is the true sayer of the people. But people that do real art and really can bust a pen, these are the type of people that sometimes you might not even get recognized until you dead. So the support that I get, right, it doesn't really bother me one way or, or another, you know, because I know that sometimes people just ain't ready. And those that do support me, you know, if I blow up within the next few years, they're going to be like, see, I told you I should have got down with this cat back then. They're going to be like the first movers. It's just like with technology. New technology come out. A lot of people don't get it. It's like cryptocurrency, right? 
I go to cryptocurrency mixes. These are some of the most diverse environments I've been in, right? Because everybody in there probably got different crews that don't want to listen to nothing they talk about cryptocurrency. So now they got to go find a home or a tribe through these different mixes. And I think that that's just how life is. Like people, sometimes people with you, sometimes they not. But then when they do get with you, it ain't never too late, but it's not going to have the same feeling as the people that supported you in the beginning. That's just how I see it, you know. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I think uh, you, you touch on, on on a couple of things, you know, uh, on social media. We I've seen in the past uh, this graphic of, you know, one of our people says, hey, I just got a job and everybody's liking and commenting, yo, congratulations. And then someone says, yo, I just started a business and it's crickets. Right. And and a lot of times uh, that goes because uh, I heard somebody else say, well, like, you know, the reason why a lot of the people that you grew up with or you come up with don't support you is because they they understand or they see, yo, we were we started at the same level and now they're they're up here. Right. So it's it's a bit of a of an envy situation there. But uh, we'll definitely make sure to support uh, our own to support. I'm, I'm always about it. And Tomeskin knows knows this. I'm always about highlighting our own people. It's about hi highlighting our students. We're right at the top of the hour, and I know everybody has very busy schedules. Since we spoke about support, um, as our last question, tell us, you know, plug your 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 project, your website. We see maladivinemalad.com on the screen. So let us know where where can people find you? Where can they find your books? Where can they find your project? Where can they find your company? We'll start with Jordan. Uh, let us know, and then we'll also for everybody who's watching, we'll put these on the on the notes. Uh, of the video on YouTube. So make sure that you follow those links. So Jordan, let us know where people can find you. Uh, yeah, you could uh, definitely follow me on my uh, photography page, which is at Sutton Photography. And that's a uh, Sutton Photography with two Ys at the end. So photography with two Ys. And um, so that's my photography page. And then also I have my, um, my main page, which is uh, mixed with royalty and I do double letters a lot. Mix this with two X. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tomaskin. LinkedIn. Hit me on LinkedIn. You can find me there. Um, and everything, all the other ways to get in touch with me is on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll give you the link, but Tomaskin Takare on LinkedIn. Excellent. And Mala, let us know where, we, where can we buy all these four books and all the upcoming so they own Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, but everything is my name. If you just Google my name, you'll see the whole plethora of work that I that I do and what's going on. But that's my website, which is also my name. Um, my social media accounts is my name. LinkedIn, of course, that's my name. So I made it simple for you to find me. It's just my name. Excellent. There we, there we go. So now you now you have it. Please make sure uh, you share this dialogue. It's the first one of the year. We're following up with a Women's History Month next month. So be uh, be on the lookout for that. Again, thank you all to Meskin, Mala, Jordan. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you to the person that you cannot see, Ulysse O'Dane, who is helping us produce um, in, on the back end. Thank you so much for stepping in and doing that. Ulysse is the assistant director of the BM, uh, BMCC UMLA, and she was a former uh, communications coordinator for the, the central office at CUNY BMI. Um, with, with all of that, I just leave you and thank you all for tuning in. If you have any uh, parting words uh, from the rest of the panel, thank you all again, and have a good, have a good rest of uh, Black History Month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.